bright star is cast. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I am thrilled uh, to be able to MC this event, and uh, I remember last year uh, emceeing the final event with uh, our local elected officials and um, uh, and a, a great series of speakers. Um, and actually, I was listening on the radio uh, last night uh, to a program where they were talking about, um, you know, it, what's the value of Black History Month, and does it really make sense to celebrate Black History Month? And one commentator was was saying, I, I don't want Black History Month. I don't. Why? No. No other cultural group has a History Month named after them. Um, I. I kind of come from the opposite, uh, which is I love the fact that we celebrate African American people, and I believe actually that Black History Month and Cultural History Month really ought to be um, uh, uh, something that occurs for every community every month. So I'm kind of of two minds in that Black History Month. I love the fact that we celebrate African American history. African-American history is an important component, especially of, of St. Paul and St. Paul's history. We're going to hear more about that today from our keynote speaker. But, um, but it's also important that we think about culture and celebrate culture uh, every day of the year uh, in this community. So I'm thrilled that you've taken the time today. Uh, uh, this has been a great series. We had uh, Roxanne Givens uh, in our first uh, event uh, uh, talking about actually uh, the creation of an African-American uh, cultural museum, something that actually I did my thesis work on uh, in uh, graduate school years ago. And again, that history goes back uh, decades uh, where we previously had an African-American museum and cultural organization uh, in the Twin Cities uh, years ago. And, and there's a, a very robust effort that's being put together to to bring that back and make that a reality. We also heard from Frank White, uh, who talked about the history of, uh, of uh, black baseball in uh, the Twin Cities and in St. Paul in particular. Um, and then last week, I wasn't able to make this uh, event, but I, I understood we had a very uh, engaging conversation with, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Whitney Stewart Harris around black males uh, and, uh, and black men. Um, so um, for those of you who've been able to make uh, those sessions, we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, got a full audience today, and to kick off our uh, conversation today, I want to introduce uh, my boss, Mayor Chris Coleman. Geez, uh, Robin, I've never actually spoke with toys, so <laughs> can I, I don't, you know, I, I might be tempted to, to, uh, to grab and play with him a little bit here. Um, it's nice to, uh, to be here. You know, when we celebrate or when we, when we study history, one of the things that we're supposed to, uh, re one of the reasons why we study history is because we learn about uh, what we've done in the past and we try to not repeat the mistakes uh, of the past in the future. And so one of the things that I've learned by studying history is that I schedule a very light afternoon after I eat all of this food. Uh, the first couple of years, you know, I, I, I'd come, I'd eat all this food, and it was great, and I couldn't get enough of it, and then I'd grab the dessert, and then I'd go and I'd have a series of meetings and accomplish absolutely nothing. So the, we, we've gotten a lot smarter by studying the history of this event in particular. Um, I do think it's important for us to remember what, uh, what it is, why it is that we study history. And when we study black history, it's not just about looking at it and kind of going, oh, that was an interesting fact. That was something that happened a while ago. Uh, we, we learn, we're going to learn about Gordon Parks today, who, uh, just an incredible story uh, about a, a guy who uh, had a dream, had a vision, uh, pursued that, had obstacles, challenges in his life, um, but was able to overcome them and, and become one of the most famous uh, producers in Hollywood and uh, uh, just a, 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 a man that we're honored to be able to call part of the St. Paul history. Uh, when we study the history of Martin Luther King and understand what he went through, his tri trials and tribulations, uh, it's great to look at those things and kind of understand it. What happened, you know, the marches and the, and the struggles that he fought through, whether it was the bo bus boycott or the, you know, going over the Edmund Pettus Bridge or any of those things. But if we just stop there and we just say, okay, that's a fact now that I know, then we're really not doing what we're supposed to do in terms of history. We're not learning our history so that we don't repeat the mistakes. 
If we don't look back at African American history, if we don't look back at the struggles and the trials and the tribulations of African Americans in this country with an eye towards how we change those things in the future, then we're not really studying history. We're only studying facts that have occurred. We need to understand that when we learn about Martin Luther King, when we learn about Gordon Parks, when we learn about other leaders across, you know, that, that have families, not just, not just the famous, but the not so famous, the struggles of, of individuals. When we read the stories of Rondo, when we understand the stories of the families that struggled there and that were kicked out of their homes, keep in mind what it is that we can learn from that. We learn that because of what happened in the past, we can't repeat that mistake in the future. So when we work on the Central Corridor, we have to be very purposeful and very intentional about making sure we include the people that are gonna be served by that, uh, that line, the people whose neighborhood that, that, that line runs through, the business owners on University Avenue who could be helped or hurt depending upon how we construct that line. We have to learn about Rondo so that we don't make that mistake as we build the Central Corridor, and I think we've learned that. When we learn about racism and we learn about oppression, uh, you know, we, can, we can sit there and say, well, that's an interesting fact. Uh, and a lot of people step back and say, well, geez, we have an African-American president now, so everything's okay, right? Well, if you, look at, if you look at what this president has been subjective to, if you look at how they treat him, if you look at how they disrespect him on a regular basis from the other side, uh, it tells me that we haven't learned all of the lessons of history and we still have a lot of healing and a lot of work to do. When you think about it, I, I, I walk by our fax machine today, and I keep on, every time I walk by my fax machine, I wonder why we still have a fax machine. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> because apparently the only people in America that use fax machines are racists and bigots who, on a daily basis, ship stuff to our office that if you saw it, it would disgust you in, in ways that you can't even believe. And you sit there and you say, oh yeah, we're, post, you know, we're a post-racial society, right? Wrong. We still have so much learning to do and so much. So we study this history. We study the stories of St. Paul. We study the stories of Minnesota. And we study the stories of the United States of America, but with an eye towards how we correct these problems in the future. If we don't understand that that's why we're here today, not about learning history, but about not make, making those mistakes in the, in the future, that's why we're here. So we break bread. We eat a lot of great food. Uh, we hear good stories. But let's figure out how it is that we continue to move forward. Because if we're not taking our lessons that we learned today to understand how we close the achievement gap in our schools, uh, then we're not doing what we need to be doing here. If we don't learn what we have learned over the course of this last month and take it to figure out how we close one of the highest, one of the largest disparities between employment rates of white Americans and African American Americans, then we are not doing what we need to do here as part of African American History Month. If we don't understand how we can rise everyone's boat out of poverty, if we don't understand how we can attack the mortgage foreclosure crisis that's hitting you know, disproportionately uh, uh, people of color, families of color, then we're not doing what we need to do here. So it is great that we hear these stories, but keep in mind, history is about not repeating the mistakes of the past. Let's not make those mistakes again. Let's correct the mistakes. Let's move forward. Let's close the achievement gap. Let's close the employment gap. Let's close the housing gap. Let's do what we need to do as a community to really, really, truly uh, empower all the lessons that we have learned and really equalize the playing field in our community. So thank you all for being here. With that, I have a proclamation, I think. Do I have a proclamation, Paul? Chai has a proclamation. <laughs> it's always good to have. Chai, if Chai is nearby, I know that I'm prepared. Whereas on February 11th, 1986, the United States Congress passed Public Law 99244, designating February 1986 as National Black African American History Month. Actually, then it was Afro American History Month. So we've already progressed a little bit. Now it's African American History Month. Whereas on February 28th, 1996, Senate Resolution 229 was issued, commemorating Black History Month. And on February 16th, uh, the Senate issued uh, a resolution celebrating Black History Month. Whereas Black History offers all Americans an occasion and opportunity to gain a fuller perspective of the contributions of Black Americans to our nation and to honor the African Americans who overcame injustice and inequality to achieve financial independence and the security of self-empowerment that comes with it. Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King once said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It bends towards justice, but here is the thing. It does not bend on its own. It bends because each of us in our own ways put our hand on that arc and we bend it in the direction of justice. 
Now, therefore, I, Christopher Cloland, proclaim February 2012 to be Black History Month in the city of St. Paul. Let's learn our lessons. Let's move forward. Thank you. I want to introduce uh, uh, two other of our elected officials that are here with us today. Russ Stark from the Minneapolis, Minneapolis St. Paul City Council. I've already shipped him across the river. <laughs> and Rafael Ortega, Commissioner from Ramsey County, to also provide proclamations. That's actually pretty funny, Paul. I've, I've got, I, I do represent the, the, the western side of the city. And um, I do have some colleagues who consider that part of the city part of Minneapolis, but that's another story. Um, I'm just going to uh, read this proclamation that the city council approved uh, earlier in the month uh, to celebrate this, this great occasion. Uh, whereas Black History Month, as we know it today, started its month-long observance in 1976 to celebrate the African-American people and to highlight the role African-Americans have played in the development of medicine, politics, government, community leadership, science, business, religion, education, literature, theater, music, arts, sports, and many other areas of our civic and national culture. And whereas during this month, we recognize the courage and tenacity of many hardworking Americans whose legacies are woven into the history and fabric of our city and our nation and honor the extraordinary achievements of African Americans and their essential role in shaping our community. And whereas during this year's observance of Black History Month, the city of St. Paul will recognize those who have set new horizons and served as visionaries for our community through such varied endeavored endeavors as preserving cultural history, recording sporting achievements, creating a spirit of empowerment, and showcasing the community through photography, written word, and film. And whereas, by sharing the stories of these visionaries, we better understand the contributions of other extraordinary men and women who have given their collective efforts, energy, and spirit to creating new horizons so all can discover them and take them further on. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of St. Paul, the St. Paul City Council, not Minneapolis, <laughs> recognizes February 2012 as Black History Month. There's another horizon out there. And be it further resolved that the City Council encourages all residents to join in recognizing the contributions and achievements of the extraordinary individuals whose new horizons will encourage future generations in the City of St. Paul. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Ramsey County Board of Commissioners, it is my pleasure and honor uh, to read this pro proclamation. Whereas Black History Month was founded in 1926 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson to celebrate the many achievements of African Americans in the United States. We at Ramsey County celebrate Black History Month, not only this month, but throughout the year. And whereas black Minnesotans have shaped the culture and history of Minnesota and the United States, and whereas University of Minnesota graduate and A and N AACP Executive Director Roy Wilkins won the Presidential Medal of Freedom 45 years ago in 1967. And whereas 25 years ago in 1987, St. Paul and world playwright August Wilson won the Pulitzer Prize for his great play Fences. And whereas Alan Page became the first African American elected to the Minnesota Supreme Court 20 years ago in 1982, in 1992. And whereas we reflect the past, present, and future achievements and contributions of African Americans, stand against divisions that would separate us, and will fight for complete liberation, complete equality, complete opportunity, and complete respect for everybody. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of Ramsey County Commissioners that the month of February is Black History Month in Ramsey County and be it further proclaimed that Ramsey County employees and citizens celebrate the contributions that African Americans have made and continue to make in Minnesota and around the world. Thank you on behalf of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce um, a dear, dear friend and a longtime uh, colleague, uh, Robin Hickman. I met Robin Hickman, I think, uh, pr possibly 40 years ago, even. <laughs> but Robin and I worked together uh, my first job out of uh, uh, in graduate school over 25 years ago, working at the Council on Black Minnesotans. Robin and I met, uh, and her passion, her energy, her knowledge, um, 
have been an absolute inspiration uh, to me over the years in the multitude of commissions, boards. I mean, I have served on uh, every possible advisory structure you can imagine with Robin. And uh, for many of us in the room who have worked with Robin, um, you know that uh, when she walks in the door, she's all about business. Uh, she is all about uh, the work uh, and the principle of the work and carries that throughout, uh, throughout her work. She is the CEO and executive producer of Soul Touch Productions, uh, television and film production, youth mentorship and media consulting company whose mission is to make meaningful media and produce powerful social impact experiences. Um, Robin worked for many years at uh, uh, Twin Cities Public Television as executive producer of community affairs programming, uh, did award-winning work uh, with HBO and at uh, TPT over the years uh, on a range of, of projects. Um, she's an educator, a writer, a filmmaker, um, and truly is one of the people where biographies really don't do justice uh, to a life, particularly when one lives the principles. And so Robin, in her day-to-day -day engagement with young people, with elders, uh, really, really uh, lives the principles that she preaches. Uh, and, um, uh, and her work over the years, again, has just been stunning. She's going to talk with us today, uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, about uh, uh, her great uncle Gordon Parks, uh, which has been uh, one of her lifelong passions. Um, uh, and um, if, if it, the apple does not fall far from the tree. And as I was reading about uh, Gordon's uh, life and work, um, the diversity of skills, the diversity of experience, the living of that experience and those principles, uh, the apple truly does not fall far from the tree in that Robin really uh, is a shining example of that. So please join me in welcoming Robin Hickman. Thank you so much, Paul. I have to give a special thanks to um, my own other home brother, Rita's Fletcher, and uh, the committee for having me. Um, I also need to thank all the public officials, city and the county, who proclaimed January 16th in honor of my mother. And Mayor Coleman, I don't know, she's still. Your reading of her proclamation was precious. The way you wove it into your speech, it was precious. So I want to thank you. And um, for all of y'all that did that, because today I dedicate my sharing with you to the love of my life, my brilliant, brave, and beautiful vision of possibilities, Patricia Frazier Hickman, who passed away on December 11th. And there are days when I don't know why I keep doing all of it, because it was always about mama. Now I'm affirmed, and I know why. I have to keep doing the work that she inspires. Mama had some pearls of wisdom. And believe mama, because mama is connected to Uncle Gordon, but this mama is a little bit of mama today. <laughs> One was be humble, but know your worth. We're going to talk about that today. And she also taught us to take our rightful place in the world. Take our rightful place. And she, my mother was ill for a number of years and homebound, but mama can be here with me today. I know she's here. She was so overjoyed that her baby girl got to take her rightful place at City Hall when I worked for the Scheibel administration. So it means so much for me to be here today. There was an article in the Highland Villager, and I got to pose in front of the vision of peace up there like this. Oh, Mama just loved it. She called everybody about that. <laughs> My mother was um, unapologetic in her commitment to nourishing young lives and ensuring that we all had a quality of life. Mama exemplified power, the power and the richness of a spirit-filled simplicity. And that is why, and I am, Uncle Gordon is the baby brother of my dear, dear grandmother, Lillian Parks Thomas. And that's, this is the fruit really not falling far from that tree. You know, I love Uncle Gordon now, but Grandma Lillian. And um, he is the uncle of my father, Bobby Hickman. But he loved my mama because my mom's simplicity and her spirit, he just fell in love. And this is my mother, so this is to honor her. I mean, you see it all in the picture. Y'all could come up. I got the little display over here. 
But he really loved her, and often he would have invite me to grand affairs on the East Coast, and he called and said, baby, bring Patty. <laughs> and this was their last time um, together. So I thank you, Mama. I thank you, Nana. And I thank you, Uncle Gordon, and believe it. They're all three here together with us today. I need, at this time, and I want to talk because we had this all hooked up. See, I'm a producer. And I'm like, it was hooked up, and I had it laid out, but something came down, so I need someone to help get the image up because I have a video. Because usually when I start to lay the first, Jackie, hey, Jackie, the first thing I like to do is bring Uncle Gordon into the room. So here we're going to go. We're going to get that set up there. Because today is about the promise that I made to Uncle Gordon the last time I visited him in New York. And that's where the doll comes in. He loves my dolls. This is Gordon. For all those you know me, I, I'm the doll queen. But this doll actually brought him out of a depression during one of my visits. It was that visit when we got to cry together. And he said, baby, what are we going to do about black boys? What's going to happen to black boys? What are y'all going to do with my stuff? Today's about what I'm going to do with his stuff. And so I would like to share this piece that I have just, this was actually when Uncle Gordon was 86, this piece. But some of the work that I'm most proud of is the work that I got to do with my colleagues um, at uh, Twin Cities Public Tele Television, Don't Believe the Hype. This is it all. The generations sitting together, claiming their place in history. So we'll just hit this one and there we go. He was the first black photojournalist to work for Life magazine, the first black person to write, direct, and produce a Hollywood film. Now, at the age of 83, Gordon Parks doesn't sit back on his laurels, admiring all of his first ever's accomplishments. Instead, he shares his experience and wisdom with the young people who would follow in his footsteps. Newsnight's Daniel Bergen shows us. Understand the power of the media. It was a gathering that bridged a half century gap of black Minnesota media makers. But I told all of the Muslims and the Panthers and the rest of them that I had chosen my weapon to fight what they were fighting. Who is the man that would risk his neck for the weapons Parks chose were the camera, the pen, and other creative outlets that he used to make change. As part of the Juneteenth Film Festival, Parks hooked up with the young producers from KTCA's Don't Believe the Hype. Although the one-time St. Paul resident made much of his impact decades before these Twin Cities youth were born, they still value this elder, and they value speaking for themselves through media. I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do in college, and I came on the show my senior year, and I'm about to finish a telecom major and then try to move into film. And I look at this man, and if it wasn't for Gordon Parks, who knows if, who knows if John Singleton or Spike Lee would even be able to be where they are to let me hopefully one day be where I want to be. And the media is too powerful to just watch it. The media is powerful, but you cannot be afraid of it. You have to know how to take a hold of it and make it work for you. In the 50s and 60s, Park's work as a photojournalist proved that media power meant black power. I was riding with the Panthers one night, and one of the young men said, if uh, you wrote the choice of weapons over again, would you write it the same way? I said, uh, yes. He said, with those honky cops following us back there, with their guns trained on us? I said, look, I know what you're talking about. I'm in here with you. If they start shooting at us, I'm going to die with you. You got a 45 automatic on your lap. I have a 35 millimeter camera on my lap. If I get back safely and get my story out in life, my camera has done more, a more powerful job than your automatic portfolio. <laughs> and that was, that was, that was a whole, whole point in, in showing it. Now, as, as it happened, the story in Life magazine got out. The Black Panthers had a chance to say what a lot of things they wanted to say. The young Black Panther in the car who challenged me that night died in an ambush. Mm -hmm two weeks later down in, in, in L.A. Where grows
grows the learning tree. The hype crew, as well as the current crop of black filmmakers, follow in the path of this Minnesota Renaissance man who recalled breaking Hollywood's color barrier. What made you start your directing career? Uh, I had written a book that you're holding right in your hand called Learning Tree. And he said, I'm serious. I read your book. I love it. And my father owns the studio, and we would like for you to direct the film. I said, fine. <laughs> and he said, who would you like to write the screenplay? I said, I don't know anyone out here. He says, why don't you write it? You wrote the book. I said, why not? <laughs> then he said, I hear you're a composer. I said, yeah. He said, why don't you write the music for me? I said, why not? <laughs> then in the end, he said, all right, you're going to be the first black director in Hollywood. You're going to need a lot of clout. And a lot of clout means a lot of power. And he said, I suggest that you produce it also for Warner Brothers. <laughs> I said, why not? <laughs> because uh, a few, uh, yes, last year, the Library of Congress picked the, the Learning Tree film as one of the 25 most important films ever made in the history of <laughs> That shows you what you can do if you really want to try. So I expect much more of you than me, because you're much brighter than I am. <laughs> he inspired a sense of ownership in those young people. And that's how we make history relevant to them. When we inspire them, that's the best way we can preserve our legacies. I just love that piece. And when I show it to young people, and I point out that he's bowing at you. So that's what my journey with you today is going to be about. We heard about the, we know about the disparities. I'm in classrooms with our children every day. I know, I often say, we've lived the answers we're seeking. It wasn't always like this. There's a powerful West African word, Sankofa. Let's go back and reclaim that which was lost. And we can do this. So that is why I am so serious. My heart is racing. And I can usually do these and just do my thing. But I don't think there would ever be a more, a more important audience as I look at the chief choice of weapons, more powerful in shooting a camera than a gun. Let's put those cameras in the hands of these young people. As I see, and they will be acknowledged as students from Gordon Parks High School. I love them. We can do this. We must do this. Born 93 autumns ago in a tiny prairie town in Kansas, Gordon Parks became the first black staff photographer for life and the first African American to direct a feature film. He also developed the creative vision for Essence magazine. Here a beloved niece says goodbye to an icon and master lensman. It's by me to be approached by Essence magazine so when I was a little girl, I could look at the cover of that magazine and see, oh my God, I could be anything. For them to co connect with me, to write a tribute to my uncle, oh my goodness. But that's the only little piece I'm gonna get giddy about as I talk about my personal stuff. For Uncle Gordon's 90th birthday, I gave him a photograph of me when I was six months old. In it, I was holding a copy of The Learning Tree and on the back I wrote, Uncle Gordon, I was a baby prodigy at six months, I began researching the documentary of your life, Love Robin. When he called me back to say he had received it, he laughed deeply and said, I know that's right, baby, I know that's right. Three years later, my uncle died, and as the family readied for his memorial in New York and his burial in the state of Kansas, I realized I am a twig on the branch of that learning tree. Uncle, uncle Gordon inspired not only what I do for a living, but how I should do it. His philosophy was that if you're entrusted to tell someone's stories, no matter what form of media you're in, the primary person is the one whose story is being told, not the reporter, not the photographer, but the piece of person being interviewed. More, most important, he taught me about establishing trust. When Uncle Gordon was working, he wouldn't pull his camera out for weeks, for weeks or more. Uh, um, after meeting the subject, whether it was a gang member in Harlem, street children in Brazil, or Malcolm X. 
He took the time to build a relationship before he actually began taking the pictures. He knew he was a guest and that there was a covenant to be honored. That's how he captured the magic in people. Uncle Gordon was never formally trained in any of the forms he mastered, but when he'd read you his poems, serenade you on the piano, or even fry up a mean batch of catfish and sweet potatoes, you wouldn't have guessed that he was self-taught. The youngest of 15 kids and homeless as a teen, teen, he had known what it was to be hungry, cold, and poor, but he chose his weapons wisely against those ills his camera, his paintbrush, his piano, his pen. With them, he created a new vision for black, of black people. He gave us our modern day coming of age story with the learning tree. With Shaft, he gave us a show enough superhero. Hero. Cause he was a bad mother. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and with Essence Magazine, he showed us our, his, our, he showed us his glory, our glory. That's how he captured the power and the beauty of the people. He was also a co-creator of Essence Magazine. Many people don't know that. I have many, 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 many personal, personal memories, and I had a great journey with Uncle Gordon. But I think back and reflect on when I approached him to make the documentary of his life. I went to New York to meet with him, to beg him, Uncle Gordon, it's time. And he had shared with me that the day before I had arrived that someone had tried to mug him. And he sat there and he shared, he had tears in his eyes then as he talked about, baby, what are we going to do about violence? He showed me on the table letters from young people that he had received about the violence in their lives. And I said, Uncle Gordon, your life is the blueprint. Let's do this. He said, are you ready, baby? I said, I'm ready. And that began a journey. Whoa. Woo. We wanted it for PBS. They passed, so we got HBO. But um, when, when the show was in the can and... Um, about to air, I got a call from the director who said we had had three Emmy nominations. He said, you should be the one to call Gordon. I said, okay. I'm coming down 94, got off on Lexington, parked on Marshall. There's some brothers that were wearing the oversized white T-shirts, the pants sagging, hanging on the car, sitting in front of me. I parked, got Uncle Gordon. I said, hey, Uncle Gordon, we got these Emmy nominations. He said, congratulations, baby, that's all you. And I just started crying because it was a six year journey that I should write a book about, but we got it done. And I just cried, and, he, and the brothers in the car, they said, hey, yo, yo, hit me, what's wrong? I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. But I just cried, and I said, Uncle Gordon, I don't care about any Emmy nominations just to hear you say that. And I realized at that moment that that journey was about those brothers, the timing of all of that. Again, my last visit with him, he was concerned about the destiny of young black boys. Now, a lot of people don't know that because he was international renaissance man. But in his later days, he was concerned and went, reflected back on his journey walking the streets of St. Paul. So I'm here. And with all of you, all, many of you are here. I even thank you. I start naming all the names. I have half y'all, all y'all. We have to do this for those young people that are in the photos over there. We have to do this. We saw Don't Believe the Hype. And there was a young man at Don't Believe the Hype who used to come to the hype meetings and say, y'all, we got to be about tell of vision versus tell live vision. And so when I was first meeting with young boys at Webster Elementary School, now Obama, they became my first tell of vision crew. And little brother said, we get to be a television crew, man. I said, no. And the other boy said, no, we get to be a tell of, vi tell of vision crew because we get to tell our visions. And young James their first assignment, write a story about your life. Do a report about your vision for your life. Now, these two young men had experienced Uncle Gordon at the Ordway when they had a celebration, when Vocal Essence was trying to sing ch Shaft. It was, shut your mouth. It was really, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the little boys remembered that. They remembered that, and they were asking me questions about, Uncle Gordon, everything that they asked about was him being homeless and him trying to stab the conductor on the train and homelessness. And I said, okay, 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 we'll, we'll deal with that. But the whole journey with them was in, introducing to Uncle Gordon. So the young man wrote his poem or his little report. He said, I have a vision to do better in school and maybe one day I'll go to college and I'm gonna play in the NBA. Sixth grade boy, and he said, but who am I kidding? I'm only gonna live to be tw uh, 21. 
I said, that's okay. Because I had 12 weeks with him. And every other week, little James would come and say, you know, Miss Robin, I think I'm going to do photography like Mr. Parks. Then a few weeks later, no, 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 I'm going to write poetry like Mr. Parks. Then it was, no, 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 I'm going to direct a camera like Mr. Parks. But most precious, at the end of the school year, he said, Miss Robin, I think I can live to be 92 wow. like Mr. Parks. That's real. That is real. We can, we can do this. Ah, when I would go and visit Uncle Gordon to tell him about the Choice Brothers, the Choice Fellows at Red Wing Correctional Facility, where I met a teacher who told me that he had students that learned how to read, reading the choice of weapons. I met young men who said, I had never read a book before. And so we worked with these young men there for four months. And I would go to New York and introduce Uncle Gordon to these young men, and he would stand in his kitchen crying as he would read their letters. That's what it was about for him. And that one regret I had when we made that documentary is we didn't get Uncle Gordon back here because when Uncle Gordon would visit with my father over the years, he would go up to Stillwater because he remembered if it had not been for the grace of very spiritual, he survived off the faith of his mother. But all the years with those young men and, and because of time, I'm not, I had some poems and whatnot from them. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful journeys. Young men who, in that program, they would, okay, Miss Robin, we have to be the ones to raise, help raise the funds to assure we can keep Choice of Weapons going. And they would get dressed up and go to those boardroom tables at those foundations, taking their rightful place, getting out and calling me and promising never to go back to Red Wing, and many of them did not. We can do this. Oh, Gordon Parks High School. Was so fortunate to walk with the Ordway to do a residency at Gordon Parks, my next television crew. And they created a photo essay exhibit about hope and peace. And we were up in the towers where the Ordway offices are and they were putting together their exhibit, multi group of students. And their exhibit was to hang in Kincaid's during this, the Ordway's Children's Festival. I said, y'all, let's take a little walk down the street to see where your exhibit's going to hang. And as we walked down St. Peter, I said, let's stop, y'all. You need to know what this building over there, that Italian restaurant used to be Frank Murphy's, as featured in the wonderful Lost Twin Cities 3 by producer extraordinaire Emily Goldberg. I'm so glad she's here. Where we got to walk in with some other students and show them that they were walking in the footsteps of Gordon Parks. And so I said, you know what? Let's take a tour while we're down here. And um, we went to Kincaid's, and one of the students said, you know what, it's so expensive. Well, look at that menu, it's expensive. I'll never eat here. Well, the management, of course, invited them as their guests the next week, and it was a great thing. But we went over to Rice Park. I said, okay, that building over there, that was the Minnesota Club. Uncle Gordon worked there as a busboy. St. Paul Hotel, let's go into St. Paul Hotel to see where he worked. And they, a little Latina sister, she said, Oh my God, this place is so fancy. I never thought I'd be in a place this fancy. And she just weeped. And then one said, there's Mr. Parks' photo on the wall. It was beautiful. I said, this is just the beginning, y'all. We went back up to the towers to finish up our exhibits. And one of the young ladies said, I realize we're Mr. Parks' hope. Believe it. Believe it. Yes, you are. Last May was proud to receive the community, the Vision Trust, which I'd like to thank any members of the Gordon Parks and the Footsteps of Gordon Parks Vision Trust. We received a state humanities grant from the Council on Black Minnesotans to launch in the footsteps of Gordon Parks. This must be the place in the nation to experience Gordon Parks. So I'm very proud to work with many folks to bring this to life. We will have, um, in a few weeks, we're going to meet about that sculpture that's long overdue for Rice Park and other places throughout the city that symbolize Twin Cities, actually, his footsteps. We're going to meet to talk about why not have St. Paul Reed's Choice of Weapons in the Learning Tree. Who's, who's anybody from the library here? Okay. <laughs> we will re- create and renew a choice of weapons institute. Can't you see it? Bringing in all of the people who love Uncle Gordon from all over the nation to walk with our young people 
putting those cameras in their hands, putting that, I, I, I was with Spike Lee last summer. I said, man, we need you in St. Paul. We can do that. Joe Spencer, who's in the Vision Trust, he said, you know, we need to have a Sundance-esque annual celebration to Gordon Parks. Why not? Why not? We can do it. Very, very excited. Lecture series, lining the people up. Let's do it here. I know they have the foundation in New York, and there's a great museum in Kansas, but this is the place where he chose his weapon. And believe me, I bear witness to it all the time, the transformation. But we launched the initiative at Maxfield Elementary School with fifth grade boys. We had family members come in, and they talked about Uncle Gordon. We showed videos, and the little brothers were so excited because the first course we had the little pizza and everything. And they went around to talk about what it meant to them to walk in, the, in Gordon Parks' footsteps and to be his hope. It was beautiful. And I said, OK, guys, we're going to take a short field trip. They put, on their, they put on their little stuff, and we walked down the street to the house that Uncle Gordon lived in. His last visit here, he said, baby, take me to the house. Uncle Gordon, I don't know. I know it's on St. Saint, Saint Anthony somewhere. We, I took him to the house, which was about a half a block from Maxfield, and he just stood there and he just looked at it. That's the house that he was thrown out of by my aunt's husband into sub-below zero weather, and that began his journey. And the little boys were like, oh my God, we're really walking in Mr. Parks' footsteps. I said, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And little Kavion said, Miss Robin, I, we should have a book of us. We should have a book. There should be a book in the footsteps of Gordon Parks. I said, you down to be my little co-editor, you know, co-editor? Yeah. So I snatched him up then, and he became the young intern for this. So when we have Vision Trust me uh, meetings, Kavion's holding it down. We can make it that easy. We just have to do it. We just have to do it. Lastly, because I have a few minutes, I have one more video to show you. I was so honored to walk um, with my dear brother, Hannibal Lacumbe, who just had an incredible, in the spirit of being concert, vocal essence witness at the Ordway. He started his journey here in October doing genealogy workshops at Boys Totem Town, Gordon Parks High School, Ujama Place, and Hennepin County Home School. The first day at Boys Totem Town, he talked to the brothers about legacy. He talked to one of the young men. He said, man, if you were to die tomorrow, what would your legacy be? He said, man, nothing. Oh, but that was October. Because in February, that young brother was on the stage of the Ordway lifting up his voice. We have to do this, and we can do this. And the greatest gift Gordon Parks left to us is his life to pour that into our young people. They don't have the Gordon Parks. Yes, great things in Kansas and in Fort Scott, New York, but we can really claim it. But what will we do with all of this? We've already proven that we can turn some things around. My greatest um, work, again, is with young people and putting the camera in their hand. Um, there is a book by the author Sharon G. Flake, who was the author, uh, is the author of the book that inspires a movement that's been so blessed to, um, to um, walk with other young ladies, loving the skin I'm in. And it was inspired by her book, The Skin I'm In. And um, her latest book is entitled, You Don't Even Know Me, and it's dedicated to young men. And these young men studied Uncle Gordon, and they brought the poem to the book to life. And I asked them, I said, I wonder if Uncle Gordon made that statement, you don't even know me. I said, but brothers, he didn't care if they knew him or not. They made sure we knew him. And so I'd like to show this. We could pop that in quick. And while he's doing that, we'll let that play. But I'm going to read this poem, his final words, or his poem, Come Sing With Me. Despite the turmoil, anguish, and despair. Uh-oh. What's that? OK. Despair. Disrupting the planet we inherited. There is something good I choose to sing about. That something lies within us, patiently waiting, beneath us, above us, and around us. Its peaceful message yearns to fill our places of murderous anger and hatred to flourish forever. Hope is the song I have chosen to sing, a deathless song flowing steadily beside my faith. 
Whenever the fist of doubt knocks at my door, it's powerfully turned away by my hopeful singing. When things go from bad to worse, I still sing my song. Why not? It helps me, it helps me endure the bloodthirsty days. Once the earth's fire had devoured my hopes and my twisted solid, my sister's soul slid toward hell. Fate come, Rick came racing from another direction. Pinned to it was a built of sun with new instructions. These, it said, are for you. Suddenly fear was gone. I had made peace with the mean roads I had walked. My jackals could now lie down in truth. From that day on, I began singing the song of hope. I still sing it loud above the waves, the fire, the darkness, and the mud. We have to give them songs of hope. And so these are some young brothers that bring me hope along with all of the other young people that I let them know I'll need you one day more than you need me. Don't know a thing about me. Don't know a thing about me. Don't know a thing about me. And you still don't know a thing about me. I see in your class and I play by the rules. I'm young, I'm fly, I'm black, so of course I think I'm cool. Geometry is my thing, and physics is just a breeze. So what bothered me last week when you said I should be happy with that C? So I've just been wondering lately, trying to figure out just how it could be that you around me so often and still don't know a thing about me. You see me on TV, marching in the band. Then you flick the channel, and there I am again. Cups on my hand, a coat over my head. The news anchor's warning that I'm someone you should dread. The police say I'm a menace, that you should be on the alert. The nightly news recounts all the people that they say I've hurt. The mayor says I'm a threat. Psychologists call me depressed. Bloggers don't know what's up with me, so they make up all the rest. You know, I've been wondering lately, trying to figure out just how it could be, that you could see me so often and you still don't know a thing about me. I live next door to you. You see me on the bus. Sometimes you even tell me, child, just be quiet, just hush. Then I'm out with my boys, two, five, or even ten. It's funny when that happens, you don't seem to know me then. I'm just another black boy, a threatening scary sight, a tall, dark, eerie shadow moving towards you late at night. You know, I've been wondering lately just how it could be that you talk to me so often and still don't know a thing about me. We hang out on the corner together, holding up the wall. I tell you about my dream, you just want to talk basketball. I pull out my plans, detailing the cities I'll rebuild one day, swearing that the people will know my name across the USA. You tell me to quit fronting. You ask who I think I am. Pretending that I'm better than you? You know I really am. You talk about my house, the clothes I wear sometimes. Then you really hit me with what's been on your mind. I've been wondering lately, trying to figure out just how we can be. That we call each other brother, and you still don't know a thing about me. Last night I had a dream. I flew right past the stars. Nobody was holding their pocketbooks or double locking the cars. I chatted with the moon, calculated the circumference of the sun. But before I woke up, I decided to take a run. I ran across the Milky Way, stole a peek at Saturn's rings, hip hopped across the universe, I was me. I can do anything. But then I dived into a million black holes, resting my feet in the North and South Pole. Slipped into my mother's dreams, my daddy's nightmares too. We talked about my future and the great things. I will do. But dreams don't last forever, and night turns into day. Where people who don't know you try to block tomorrow's way. But nothing can ever stop me, or keep me from what's mine. The stars on fire, inside you, shining, refining. Reminding me that I define me in the brightness of my destiny. The brightness of my destiny. My destiny. The brightness of my destiny. The brightness of my destiny. The brightness of our destiny. Let's walk with them. In the spirit of Uncle Gordon, they just pulled it together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Of our bright stars.